I actually did an introduction to Monte Carlo in the last problem session, but I can do it again in the problem session on Thursday. I think that that's what we'll do. These various interesting topics that are in the second half of the book, I can try to put them into the problem session, unless students have real questions about the actual material on Monday and Wednesday. So do you want to catch this? Okay. So as far as the dielectric go, I'll just say a couple of things. NKS units, or rather SI units, the divergence of the displacement is a free charge density. In electrostatics, the curl of E, which otherwise would be V dot, is zero. In this case, one can write the electric field as minus the gradient of a scalar potential. And then by integrating, if you integrate the curl of E over a rectangle between two dielectrics, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2, the curl of E is zero, and that tells you that E1 is equal to E2, or if N is the normal, then N cross E2 minus E1 is zero. So that's one of the important boundary conditions for electrostatics. The other important boundary condition is, this is called Gauss's law. And again, if you have an interface between two dielectrics, you construct one of those pillboxes like that, and you integrate over the surface. The divergence of D over the surface, the divergence of D in the volume is equal to the integral of D dot DA over the surface. It's also equal to rho, which is equal to the charge inside Q, which is the area, that's this area here, times sigma 2 minus sigma 1, and that is then equal to the area times D2 minus D1, and that tells you then that N cap dot D2 minus D1 is, actually I should have said sigma 2 minus sigma 1, it's just simply sigma, because there's only one surface. It's only, this thing is infinitesimally thick. So this is equal to sigma. If you have a linear dielectric, then D is epsilon times E, and this is called the permittivity. And you can think of it as, in other words, this epsilon is epsilon 0 times some epsilon of the material, and that epsilon of the material, well, yeah, that's right, is epsilon 0 plus pi, and you can write that as epsilon M times epsilon 0. So the notation here is a little bit, a little bit ambiguous. People don't want to write epsilon 0 and epsilon all the time, and so you sometimes just call the whole thing epsilon. Anyway, this is a consistent notation. All right, I think that's all I'm going to say about dielectrics, because I think we need to get into complex variable theory. Does anybody have any questions about the dielectrics? All right. 
It's, by the way, a subject that I kind of, I mean, I learned it as an undergraduate, but in graduate school I just said, well, I already know that stuff. And then working in biophysics, I found that this was of great importance in the fact that when working on dielectric problems like man and West View. Okay, so so much for that. Let's go to complex variable theory then. And there's a, so what we're talking about is an analytic function. And this is a function, first of all, it's a function of a complex variable z. z is x plus i y. And we're saying that a, that this is differentiable at z with derivative f prime of z if the limit f prime of z, which is the limit as z prime goes to z of f of z prime minus f of z over z prime minus z, if this limit exists, no matter how z prime approaches z in the complex plane. So in other words, we've got this point z. z prime can come in from over here. It can come in from over there. It could spiral in like that. But no matter how it goes in, if z prime goes to z, then this limit has to exist. Okay? So it's different from in real analysis where you say f prime of x is just the limit as f of x prime minus f of x over x prime minus x. There are only two ways that x prime can approach x. x prime can go like this or x prime can go like that. It can approach from above or from below or above. But in the complex plane, you can come in from any angle. And so that's what differentiable means. So the definition of differentiable is a little more subtle in complex variable theory. It's not hard. It's not complicated. But there's more to it. By the way, the nature of complex variable theory is actually a subject that is very attractive. And the reason is that there are certain simple things that you can learn right away. In fact, I hope to teach you all of them today. And then everything else in complex variable theory is sort of footnotes to those very basic ideas. And so it's because of that structure, it's a kind of seductive subject. Now, if the function is differentiable in some small region like a disk around z0, then it's said to be analytic at z0. So analytic at z0 means differentiable in small disk about z0. So that's what analytic means. It means you're differentiable in a tiny circle around a tiny disk around z0. All right. Are there any questions while I erase this board? So that's a really important thing to get straight, is the definition of differentiable in for a complex function, function of complex variables. All right. 
examples. Well, if f of z is g to the n, then um, f of z prime minus f of z is z plus dz to the n minus z to the n. And, well, this is normal. This is tiny dz, so if you expand that, that z to the n plus n z to the n minus 1 times dz minus z to the n. So this is just n z to the n minus 1 dz, where of course dz is um, z minus z. And consequently, then uh, the derivative exists no matter how, that is to say, if you have f of z prime minus f of z over z prime minus z, well, z prime minus z is dz, so this just cancels and it's just nz to the n minus 1. And, and since dz's, the dz's or the z prime minus z's cancel, then uh, it doesn't matter what they are, they just cancel. So that's, um, so any monomial is uh, differentiable at z or at any point. And um, in fact, obviously, a sum of monomials is differentiable. In fact, it's differentiable everywhere. So it's analytic. And a function that's analytic everywhere is said to be entire. And um, in fact, then any polynomial, p of z, in other words, a0 plus a1z plus a2z squared plus dot dot a n z to the n. Any such polynomial, any polynomial in z, z being x plus y, y, is uh, differentiable everywhere, it's analytic everywhere, and uh, it's said to be entire. Any questions? Okay. Well, now, it turns out that the most important theorem of complex variable theory is an immediate consequence of the definition of differentiable. Differentiability. Immediate consequence of differentiability. And um, so to see that, suppose f of z is analytic at z0, then near z0, it must be of the form f of c0 plus c minus z0 f prime of z0 near z0. Okay. So now what we can do is we can, this is the point z0, we can do what's called a contour integral around the point z0. And what are the points on this contour? Well, they're going to be z equals z0 plus epsilon e to the i theta. Okay. When theta is 0, it's just this point here. When theta is pi over 2, it's this point up here. When theta is pi, it's over here. 3 pi over 2, it's down there. Okay. So, and 2 pi, you get back there. So that's the... The, um, those are the points on the contour. And so the integral around the circle, a little O on integral sign in latex, it's ba latex it's backslash O int, um, means an integral that uh, goes, with, it goes in the contour and comes back to the same point. So if we have f of z dz, um, what is dz? Well, dz. What changes here on the contour? The only thing that changes is theta. So this is i epsilon e v i theta. That's what dz is. So d theta. So that's um, dz. 
And so now this integral then is an integral 0 to 2 prime f of z dz and dz is i epsilon e the i theta d theta and then what is f of z? Well, since epsilon is really, really small, we can use this approximation by virtue of the differentiability of f. And that gives us an integral 0 to 2 pi f of z0 i epsilon e the i theta d theta plus another integral 0 to 2 pi now, z minus z0, of course, is just, is just epsilon e to the i theta. And so then this is f prime of z0, which is a constant, as, as is f of z0, and then times epsilon e to the i theta, and then times dz, which is i epsilon e to the i theta, Theta. So we've got these two integrals, and in fact, this whole contour integral. Then, if we pull out the if we pull out the uh, constants, we have that the integral of f of z dz is. I epsilon f of c zero integral zero to two pi e i theta d theta plus in this case it's um, I epsilon squared f prime of z zero times an integral of e to the 2i theta d e theta, again, from 0 to 2 pi. Well, these are the kind of integrals that we encountered in when we were looking at studying the Fourier series. And so you know that both of those integrals are 0. The integral of e to the i theta from 0 to 2 pi it's just 1 over i times e to the i theta evaluated at 2 pi minus e to the i theta evaluated at 0. But e to the i theta is periodic, period 2 pi, so the endpoints cancel and they also cancel here. So this thing, in fact, is 0. Now, Truth be told, we've only actually proven this to order uh, epsilon squared. It could be that uh, if we included more terms in this expansion for f of z, then something might show up that's non-zero. But in fact, it, uh, it isn't. It's exactly zero. So anyway, so the, the integral is zero at least to order epsilon squared. And in fact, it's exactly. Suppose now we did the same thing, but instead of doing an integral around a circle, we did an integral around a square with z0 at the middle. Once again, we assume that f of z is differentiable, so f of z is f of z0 plus uh, z minus z0 times f prime of z0. Consider the uh, contour. The contour consists of four segments, four complex segments. This is the square of side epsilon. So the first segment is epsilon. The second segment is i epsilon. That is to say, the dz of the integral around this contour. 
In other words, BZ is going to be epsilon, I epsilon, minus epsilon, and minus I epsilon for this one here. And so those are the four DZs. And moreover, we want to know what Z minus Z0 is in each of these cases. Well, Z minus Z0 in each of these cases is, in the first case, it is minus I epsilon over 2. I hope that's what I have in my notes. Yes. The next time, it's this here, with this distance there. So that would be epsilon over 2. The next one is this one. So it's I epsilon over 2. And then the last one is just the opposite of that one. And so it's minus epsilon. Where is that? Oh, yes, yes. Minus epsilon over 2. All right. So those are our four values for Z minus Z0. And so then the integral of F of Z is then 2 integrals F of Z0 times I0 plus F prime of Z0 times I1. No, no, no. Actually, this is what I call I1. This is what I call I2. Now, the first integral is 0 because I1 is just integral DZ around the square. And so that's nothing more than the sum of these four DZs. We can call this DZ sub N and ZN minus Z0 is these things. So it's the sum N equals 1 to 4 of DZN. And those just add to 0 because it's epsilon plus I epsilon minus epsilon minus I epsilon. So it's 0. The reason why it's 0 is that we're summing up displacements that take us from this point to this point, then to this point, then to this point, and then to this point. So altogether, you're going nowhere. That's why it's 0. Any questions? What about I2? Well, I2 is a little more complicated because it is an integral. It's a sum of ZN minus Z0 DZN from N equals 1 to 4. And so this is going to be the product of these guys summed. So it's minus I epsilon squared over 2 plus I epsilon squared over 2 minus I epsilon squared over 2 plus I epsilon squared over 2. And you can see that's also 0. So what we've seen then is that the integral of a function that's analytic at Z0, the integral either around the circle that's within the region of differentiability, so the thing is differentiable all over here, say. We're integrating around that. It's differentiable at Z0 and around Z0. And the square is inside the region of differentiability, which is also the region of analyticity. And so these are two microscopic examples of Cauchy's integral theorem, which is, in fact, the most important theorem of complex variables theory. As you see, it's an immediate consequence of the nature of differentiability. All right. Now, what we can say now is that we can generalize it. So far, we've just got to have an analytic function. Then the integral around a tiny circle or a tiny square is 0. 
But suppose we have instead a region of anorticity, so the function is differentiable everywhere inside this region, the consequence is analytic everywhere inside that region. And um, now we just have some arbitrary function, however, that's closed. And so we're asking what is the value of this integral of f of z dz, f being the function that's analytic. Well, the point is you can write this region in terms of squares, tiny squares. Okay? So small, I mean, really, really tiny squares. And, um, and you notice that, that the integral, the integral, imagine integrating over each of those tiny squares. Well, you integrate over this square, then you integrate over this square, and you see that the, they have a common side. But you're going up on one in one case and down on the other, so it cancels. So all of the interior, in other words, we're going to say, what I can say is that this integral of f of z dz is the sum of the tiny epsilon integrations integrals over a square of over the squares of size epsilon squared of f of z dz. And um, it's not perfect because it's uh, we get it to be uh, sort of like this. Well, actually I could have done that. You see what I'm saying? We oh actually I should have been in here. I didn't need to be out there. So in other words, we have this one, and then this one, and this one, and this one, and so forth. Okay, so that's the, in other words, if the, if the square is sufficiently fine, then we approximate the integral. I wasn't thinking how I do this. Okay. So the integral around the contour C this is the contour C, is the same thing as the sum of all of the integrals around all of the squares because all of the <coughs> interior segments cancel and the only thing you have left is the integral around the periphery. On the other hand, these guys we know are all zero to order epsilon squared. How many of them are there? Well, the number of these is, so uh, square n, I'll, I'll call it, n equals one to the area of this thing divided by epsilon squared. That's how many little squares there are in there. And, um, on the other hand, each of these we've proven earlier can only be of order epsilon cubed. It can't be, it's zero to order epsilon squared. It's actually zero. But if, um, to, to, all, to, to all orders in epsilon. But um, if we just assume that these things were each uh, some c sub n, c sub n, c sub n epsilon cubed, and there are a over epsilon squared of them, then what you get, and then if, 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 if c is the biggest of these, the thing is still of order epsilon c a, and then the limit epsilon going to zero is zero. So in other words, we've proven that the integral around a tiny square can be of, of edge epsilon can at most be uh, epsilon cubed. There are a constant over epsilon squared of them, and the whole product ends of order epsilon, the limit epsilon going to zero, the whole thing is zero. Um, what I should have done, frankly, here was consider first the simpler case of an integral around the big square. Okay? So the integral around the big square, you then divide it up into 
and this is psi L psi L, then the integral around of f of z dz around the big square of, si of size L is equal to a sum n equals 1 to L over epsilon squared, that's how many little squares there are, of the nth integral here of f of z dz. Okay. You can imagine doing all of these little contour integrals. But the, all the interior, the integrals, around, the integrals along all the interior segments are, are cancel explicitly. And so that's why that, that's why the thing, the sum of all these integrals around the tiny squares of H epsilon is the integral around the big square. But each of these guys is at most some C epsilon cubed and there are L squared over epsilon squared of them, and so this in absolute value is less than or equal to this, which is C epsilon C L squared, and that goes to zero as you shrink the mesh to zero. Okay. So that's proof that if you have a function that's analytic in a region, the contour integral around a big square is zero, but then you can imagine Deforming the big square, for example, you can add a little vertex, a little square here, and that means that now this segment here is interior, so now the new contour looks like that. And then by adding tiny, adding and subtracting tiny squares, you can turn this into an arbitrary contour. So the upshot is, and I'm calling this a proof because we're north of Lomas. Um, The, the upshot is that the integral of an analytic function is zero if the contour C lies in a uh, region of analyticity And here, what I mean is not only C, but C and its interior. Okay. In other words, in other words, we have to be able to cover the surface it's enclosed by, this is the contour C, and this is the region of analyticity, then we have to be able to cover the interior of that region with little, little, square, little squares, and the, 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 the edges of those squares have to be points on which, on which the function F is analytic, differentiable. And so that means that the thing has to be analytic not only here, but also analytic here. So the no holds. Um, another way of saying it is this, this term, the term that the mathematicians uh, south of Lomas use is um, Simply connected. Another, and so, in other words, what one can say is that the contour integral of f of z dz is zero if f of z is um, analytic in a region in a simply connected. region R um, which contains the contour. So the contour C 
thought of as a set of points is inside the region of analyticity. And it's simply connected. It's best to give you examples. This region is simply connected. It's not simply connected. In other words, the reason it's not simply connected, the basic idea is that if you have a curve in a simply connected region that's a closed curve, then you can shrink it to zero, staying within the region. That's simply connected. When you try to shrink this, you have to leave the region, whereas if you have a curve here, you can shrink it to a point and you stay within the region. So that's the idea of simply connected. So the surface of a sphere is simply connected. The surface of a bagel isn't simply connected. A dime is simply connected. A washer is not simply connected. At least if I'm right, it's the same way a washer is. A washer looks like this. Is that right? I never took a shot. All right. So basically, we've already done the main theorems of complex variable theory. Well, this is the first theorem. One definition and one theorem. Subject's almost over. Well, except that there's so much that follows from this Cauchy integral theorem. In particular, what follows is something called the Cauchy integral formula. Okay, so well, I think we've basically done that. This in particular means that the integral of a polynomial, any polynomial, is around any closed contour is zero because the function is entire. All right. Now let's do Cauchy's integral formula. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to imagine that we have a region, a simply connected region of analyticities R. And we're going to do a closed contour in here. But now instead of integrating an analytic function, we're going to be integrating something a little bit more complicated. We're going to take the function of the f of z over z minus z zero. And we're going to try to see, well, what is this? Let me just see what we're... Okay. Well, let's first do this integral in a microscopic way, the way we were doing it over there. So what we want to do, what we can say then is that if f, if z, if z stays very close to z zero, then f of z is equal to f of z zero plus z minus z zero times f prime of z zero. I hope you're not sick. Good. The rest of the class is. So then we can say, what is this thing? This is then an integral zero to two pi. F of z zero plus z minus z zero f prime of z zero dz divided by z minus z zero. So that's what the integral is. Remember here, z minus z zero is epsilon e di theta. Dz is i epsilon e di theta d theta. And so altogether then, this is two integrals. It's f of z zero, integral 
zero to two pi. Well, so far we don't have zero to two pi. We just have this. Now we have integral zero to two pi. And we have dz. I'll do this slowly so that it becomes clear what's happening. The next term, though. Oh, well, all right. We still have this. I haven't gone to the variable theta yet. Now we pull out f prime of z zero. But now the z minus z zero terms cancel. And we just have an integral dz. Well, what is this integral, the integral dz? Zero. Right. It's zero because the integral, because it's just a sum of segments, complex segments that lead nowhere. They just lead you back to where you started from because it's closed complex. So this thing is certainly zero. Now what is this? Well, this thing is f of z zero. But now what we have, substituting for dz, dz is i epsilon e d i theta d theta. And z minus z zero is epsilon e d i theta. And so what we get is f of z zero. And now we integrate zero to pi. The EBI phase cancel, the epsilon cancel. We get I integral 0 to 2 pi d theta. And that's just 2 pi I f of z 0. So what we have then is that the integral, and this is just over a very tiny contour, c, c of size epsilon. Let me get this. So this term was automatically zero. I'll just put it zero on that. F of z, dz, z minus z zero is two pi i times that. Okay. So this is basically the microscopic. This is the microscopic version of Cauchy's integral formula. And the integral formula is normally written this way, f of c zero equals one over two pi i integral f of z dz over z minus z zero. Okay? All right, so this is the microscopic size epsilon. So, this is a, so we've proven a microscopic version of Cauchy's integral formula. Any, any questions? The beauty of this subject is that it's, is its simplicity. Okay, we, differentiability gave us the Cauchy integral theorem. And now it's giving a, given us the microscopic Cauchy integral formula. And now we want to get the macroscopic Cauchy formula. So we imagine we have a simply connected region of analyticity, no holes. We have an arbitrary contour here. And this contour will fall. All right, let me get my contour notation right, uh, straight, because. Ah, yeah, let me, let me draw it this way. We're going to go around like this, but then when we come to here, I'm going to go in. I'm going to go around like that. And then we go out and then back here. And this is Z0. And what am I going to do? I'm integrating. We call this, we call this whole contour, which is which, the big contour. C prime. So what do we have? We have the integral c prime f of z over z minus z zero dz, where we're we're going. We start here, say we go. And up, around, down, back to here. Okay. 
That is an integral in which this function f of z over z minus z0 is analytic everywhere along the contour. Okay. And moreover, this region is simply connected, and so we can, what we notice is that we can deform this contour in such a way that we deform it to just a point. In other words, we could, we could unravel this contour and bring it all around so that it's just a point here. And so, and when we, and we can do that without having the contour cross the point Z0, which is the only place where this thing is not analytic. So, um, in other words, this is a region of analyticity that is simply connected. But, the region of analyticity of this function is not simply connected because there's one point missing, namely Z0. But, we can shrink this curve to a point because it doesn't really go around Z0. Okay. All right. So this is 0. Um, on the other hand, we can now separate it into two contours. One is an integral over C, f of z, dz, over z minus z0. And this contour is just the one that goes from this point all the way around and then goes straight across to here. Plus these two segments, which cancel, plus a counterclockwise integral here. So it's plus an integral, and it's, this one is that way. This is a clockwise integral around z0 of f of z, dz, z minus z0. Okay. Well, this this is a microscopic integral now. It's right around z0. It can be of size epsilon. That's, that, that's what I meant by having it small like that. And um, the clockwise integral and the counterclockwise integral are differ by a minus sign. All right. Because they're the same sequence of complex numbers, or same sequence of ratios of complex numbers times the same sequence of dz's. It's just that the dz's in one case are minus the dz's in the other case, and the order of integration is backwards. The order of summation is backwards. But that doesn't matter. Here, you're excluding z0 from the integration context. Yeah, 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 because we're, we're, this is an integration around z0 clockwise. And the other contour never got near it. So what we have then is that the integral around the big contour of f z over z minus z0, z, minus now the ordinary counterclockwise integral around epsilon of z over z minus z0, z, the sum of those two is zero, or the difference is zero. But on the other hand, this thing, by this formula here, because we proved the microscopic Cauchy integral formula, it's equal to 2 pi i f of z0. So this says that c f of z over z minus z0 is z is equal to 2 pi i f of z0. Or as it's normally written, f of z0, 1 over 2 pi i, integral counterclockwise f of z, dz, z minus z0, and now this is a macroscopic contour. And the only proviso is that uh, the region, that the function f of z is analytic on the contour and at all points inside the contour. Or 
equivalently, that the contour lies completely inside a simply connected region of ellipticity of the function f of c. All right, well, that's basically the end of the subject. Um, in other words, it's, it's, this is the couch integral form of the couch integral theorem. Um, basically, that really is really is the heart of the subject. Let's see, I'm going to erase the board, but if I do with this cup, the cup is going to crank the floor. So while I erase this board, why don't you guys think of questions? I had a couple of jokes I was going to tell you about the time. Limit. 
z going to zero, and we get the z is one over two y Oh, 
first of all, let's introduce a little meditation. Let us mix the thoughts of you to us less. This is why the thoughts of you to us less. So I want to 
Yes. Mm-hmm. 